If someone wants me to be happy in a the band, they'll have me play guitar. If someone wants, you know, what's best for the band, they'll have me on drums. And if someone really hates me, they'll put me on bass. <laughs> if you don't see how you've influenced your own children after they've grown, take a closer look. Because it's there and it's everywhere. They don't even realize it. For me, anyone who knows me knows that every morning I drink regular brand black coffee. And also anyone who knows me will tell you that I emphasize that black coffee was good enough for my mother and my father. It was their morning staple. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. This is the Life's Learning Curve podcast. I'm Paul Hart. Stand by. Stand by. Kids, they grow up in a hurry, don't they? Now, sooner or later, we all begin to talk just like our parents spoke to us, saying the same things, using the same vernacular, that type of thing. Now, my kids are currently in their 20s, and they will find themselves doing the same thing with their kids in the future. They'll sit down, they'll talk to their kids. They will walk away and say, man, did time go by quickly? I cannot believe the kids grew up. It seems like they were just in diapers. They're going to think that they sound just like older relevant me. <laughs> Recently, I talked to my daughter Heidi about growing up and her room. I mean, I remember when I was very, very little, my room was all Winnie the Pooh decorations. And then, you know, you grow out of your Winnie the Pooh phase. Um, and then it was, you know, I became a teenager and I wanted to have posters of my pop culture idols up and they let me do that and I had a phase where I was obsessed with LA and Hollywood and so I still have my Heidi Loves Hollywood sign above my bed. Um, so I was able to always decorate it in the way that I wanted to and they were supportive of me, they meaning my parents were supportive of me playing whatever music I wanted to play. Um, my dad got me speakers when I was a teenager and he let me play music really loud, although I don't think I played it too loud, but they never told me to turn it down or anything, so that was nice. <laughs> Now, my father lived a good 91 years of his life, and he passed away just a few years back. And I remember thinking, what a shame that was, and I'll tell you why I thought that. I thought about that because of all the love and all the work and all the time he and my mom put into raising my sister and me. And I felt badly because I felt as if I didn't need him like I used to need him. And it wasn't because of his age or his time or behavior. Sure, I love him and I miss him terribly. And, and I still sought out his advice. Now, I continually throughout my life sought him out because of his direct, carefully measured, appropriate advice that he would give. Now, this is not a guy who walked around telling people what to do, where to go, and how to do it. But if you asked him for his advice, he would give it. He would think about it, decide what the best solution was, and then we'd go about solving a problem, or whatever that was. For me, his ideas were usually spot on, dead on for me. They worked very well. And I think he parented and mentored me so well for so long that whenever I got to a point where I really needed a second opinion or advice on something, I felt like I knew what direction I should go. I heard my dad's voice. I still do. That's, 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 this is the wrap. That's right. Yeah. Here's two of you. They can have seconds and thirds. Yeah. We didn't do it. We no. had, we had that was enough. So yeah. when I make those decisions, I try to do what he did. I try to take time to think it through. When I was young, I didn't dismiss my father's input because he didn't give it very often. But there was a world of knowledge I would crave from him and his life's experiences. 
At age three, my father lost his own father to a heart attack, and for the remainder of his life, I believe he chose role models and mentors to emulate. They were always people who loved God, and they loved their family, and they were there for friends. As a kid, I witnessed all of these traits in him as well. I can remember as a teenager, so I always liked when my dad would quietly dismiss me from the stagnant relatives or family friends that would come over and sit and drink coffee. My sister and I had to sit and make an appearance and sit quietly. And he would quietly walk over to me and pull me aside and whisper, just uh, make an appearance for another minute or so and then uh, you can go. And that's what I did. Now something told me that he had undergone ex similar experiences with company many years before I was born, probably in his teenage years, and he wished someone would have dismissed him from the mundaneness. When my daughter was born, my firstborn, her name's Heidi, she first learned to talk by listening to everything I had to say to her and others around her. She called me daddy, and to this day she still calls me daddy. But she listened, she copied my vocal cadence and developed the same goofy sense of humor that I have. Recently I asked my 26-year-old daughter, Heidi, what she remembers from her childhood. I would go with him for runs like a wild dog because uh, <laughs> he would go running down by the CMS uh, area so they had a track and soccer fields and I think it's been replaced with a couple other buildings but he had his running path and for some reason we always said that daddy was going running like a wild dog and then when I got old enough <laughs> I would go and run with him. <laughs> And so we would go and run like wild dogs together. We would actually run like crazy through the fields. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, seeing a parent that was into physical fitness, I think it really helped shape me into, really helped shape me into being a person that liked to be physically active. So. I run now, not as often as I probably should, but I'll go for a run. I enjoy working out um, just because I always saw my dad do it, so I knew it was important. I asked Heidi if she remembered anything about her childhood go to bed prayer time. Well, I, th I don't know if everybody else broke it up into like three prayers, but I remember it being broken up into three prayers, and it always ended with the Lord's Prayer, but then there was one in the middle. Um, but it was, uh, let's see, God bless Mama, Dada, Heidi, Riley, Ben, Dawn, BP, Berlin, Oma, Ova, Bafa, friends, family, all the animals. Let our family be happy, healthy, live long and prosper, be wise and respected, and have unconditional love. So that was the second part of the prayer, and then the third was the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> and this is my dog. Also, he really likes to bark at my computer When we were really little, um, every kid has stuffed animals and my dad would make them come to life, like, and not in a way that's like, oh yeah, my stuffed animal talks like Toy Story and they have their own world. It was like unique, flawed personalities. And I think he was probably bringing some characters that he's met throughout his life into these stuffed animals. But we would crack up every single night before I would go to bed about the things my stuffed animals were saying and doing. And like one of my stuffed animals had just all these behavioral issues, which my dad being a teacher, he probably saw a lot of kids with behavioral issues. It was always really funny 
to have our stuffed animal time every night. Um, I think it was good therapy for my dad. <laughs> now, my daughter Heidi doesn't actually need to hear me or need my guidance like before. As disappointing as that is, I never saw that coming. I thought about her leaving the house and I thought about her getting her own job and finding a boyfriend, moving on. But I never saw that coming. And to this day, it still surprises me. However, I can tell you she's made some great choices in life, career and in relationships. And although she probably stumbled somewhere along the way, I would have never known. She never let it show. She was strong and kept to herself. And who does that remind me of? My father. Now, I'm not sad about this, but it amazed me how any person that you love so much might go out and become independent of you. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the way it's supposed to be. Bye. Bye. Bye, you guys. Um, coming home is different now that I'm 26 versus when I was just in college coming home because I've established my life someplace else now. So I know that this is still home. Uh, it's funny whenever I ask my Alexa what the weather is at home, it actually still connects my iPhone to 502 just because that's where my uh, Mac.com account is set up and everything. So I know that this is home, but all of my stuff mm -hmm. is somewhere else. Um, and I know my room is still my room. My bed is still there from when I grew up and my closet's still there. All of the stuff that I have and that I took with me from this house is someplace else. My second and final born was a boy. We named him Riley. He's 23 years old now, and he calls me dad, not daddy like his sister. I asked him recently if he remembered any outstanding memories from childhood. I think I noticed when I was very young, uh, well, when I was very, very young, I was not optimistic and I was not, I don't want to say I wasn't happy, but I was just always mad, just all the time. I was, every photo I had like a frowny face on. And then somewhere along the line in first grade, I started treating everyone nicer and kinder, use please and thank you, and there's such a great response to it, I just kind of kept doing that. So we were on in St. John's with the family, and the, for whatever reason, the engine stopped. I'm not sure if we cut it or we hit the rocks, or something, because once you know the engine hits the rocks, it stops. Um, so I just jumped out and I grabbed the 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 rope that was attached to the dinghy and I swam to shore. And since it was, you know, I couldn't have done that on land, but you know, since it was floating on water, it really didn't weigh anything. But so I pulled I pulled the boat to shore, and yeah. What are we gonna do? Riley, help us! Yeah. Riley, you're overboard! What are you gonna do? He really is turning the boat all by himself. Oh my gosh! This is so cool! This is so cool! If I think from childhood, all your stories, you remember telling them at a shorter height. Like, I remember everyone being up here as I was talking to them. And whenever I retell them, I picture them as that too. But uh, I guess a good one was, uh, my mom would wash her mouth out with soap, or had no, bite down on soap if we did something. And I forgot what I did. I think I was told I bit my sister's stomach, and to this day I'm like, it's impossible, because like, my mouth was like this big, and I'm like, you can't, bite someone's stomach, and now I, I think about it, like, maybe from the side, I don't know, but I got uh, my mouth washed out with soap, and to rebuttal, I put soap in her drink, 
and I thought it was funny. How old were you? Probably like four. <laughs> And it, was, it was the pump soap too, it was, which is not the same as bar soap, I realize. That's really bad to, to, to feed to someone, but uh, she was a good sport about it and laughed. So that was, that was pretty good. As parents, we do our jobs as best we can. We try. And if we do them well, we get to see our children grow, learn, become independent, make choices good ones hopefully and then fly away someday I will die and my two kids will hopefully get together and they will have to make their own realization their own children will leave the nest just like mine did for that very necessary independence though my room is different I get to go and see the previous life I had you know once had and coming home to any place like sometimes I still pass by some of my old apartments and I think about how things were back then and versus how they are now and I, I feel the same thing when I go to the house I grew up in you know I can still picture everything every place I hit my head while running around the house and uh, yeah it's just it's just nice to come home and see see where you once were and where you are now If we do our jobs as parents, we get to see them grow and expand and learn and go off on their path and make those career choices. And you think, you know, after all the baby bottles and dirty diapers and birthday parties and special events and vacations, will it mean something to them? Well, what's my point? Without knowing it, we influence our kids in a thousand ways. Music, laughter, fitness, love of God, love of learning, patience, calmness in the storm. I started playing piano, I think when I was in kinder when I was in kindergarten, I started playing piano and it was kind of something that I didn't really choose for myself. Uh, a lot of people told me like this is a good life skill. Now that I'm older I see what they are talking about. I always wish I would have stuck with it but I ended up quitting in high school to pursue sports. I took piano lessons for a good 10 years and I became pretty good at it to the point where I could read music, not quite as good as my brother could, but um, I still am able to read sheet music. It might take me a little bit, but I've always had an interest in music. I think the reason that I backed off of it more than I typically would something else that I have an interest in is because it's more of my brother's thing. He's just naturally very, very good at music. It was always these classical pieces, which is great, but I don't really think that's what she was listening to. And I think anyone who gets into an instrument has to want to play songs that they like to truly enjoy it, not just play random things. And I think she probably fell out of interest with it, more or less, because I don't know if she was necessarily forced to play piano, but it. It seemed like once a week, you know, it's like, all right, piano lesson time, same time every week. And she had a wonderful instructor who actually taught me a good bit, too. But I'm not sure if it was necessarily for her. But that's nice that she said that, though. If you don't see how you've influenced your own children after they've grown, take a closer look, because it's there and it's everywhere. They don't even realize it. For me, anyone who knows me knows that every morning I drink regular brand black coffee. And also anyone who knows me will tell you that I emphasize that black coffee was good enough for my mother and my father. It was their morning staple. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. 
And we're sitting outside in the patio drinking coffee, as you can see. I'm going to take a sip now. That one connection made me realize just how many other things I did just like them. Things I don't even realize. My mother played piano. She was classically trained. She could play with sheet music. She also could hear a song and sit down and play it. She could play by ear. I inherited my family's piano from my mom who told me that my sister was technically a much better player. But I was the one who had a passion for music, she told me, and that I never just sat down and played music, but rather I felt it. And I do, and I did back then. I remember after school I would come home from high school when the house was empty, and I'd sit down at the piano and search for just the right chord combinations and build music slowly on a daily basis. I may add one note a day, two chords a day, but eventually I had songs. A generation later, my son Riley discovered the passion of writing and performing music. He plays multiple instruments with passion, and I couldn't be more proud. But he never got to meet my mom. His grandmother, he just missed her. She died a few years prior to his birth. I know she's proud of him, as am I. Music started for me, um, I do remember hearing a lot of music in my dad's car, uh, very specific set types, very specific songs that still today some people, if I put them on, no one would know. Um, but for me, I remember it was in sixth grade really, I had played drums before then, but I, I didn't know anything as far as notes or anything, I could just keep rhythms and stuff, and in sixth grade, it was on hat day, and it was like the second day of sixth grade. We took a field trip to the library, which was down the street, and for some reason we needed buses, even though it was two blocks away. <laughs> so the buses drove us, and um, they were showing us a database of different biographies. And the one that came up was John Lennon, and which at that time, this is crazy, it was just kind of a name I had known from people saying more than I actually knew what he was. And it was just a picture of him going like this, very cheekily, and I saw 1940 through 1980, and I'm like, it's not very long of a life. And so then I, uh, the, I came home that day, and I just started Googling everything I could about John Lennon. And of course you find out real fast that he was in the Beatles, and all this, this beautiful music that he made. And I just became obsessed, and then I had to get into guitar, I had to, I just wanted to play like the rhythm guitar parts that weren't heard in Beatles songs like he did. I think at first that was just for an aesthetic look, but then I actually could play guitar later and that's kind of where music started for me. It was just the Beatles and I remember that day in the library very well. My first band was called The Detours, if you, because I don't count any of the ones before that because we didn't really play gigs. I think we were very good looking back on it now, but we were very young and figure out until later is like sometimes it's better to be in a group with people you don't even like as people, but you like as musicians because they'll fit in better musically than you know your friends. Is music something that can save you or anybody? Music can save people, I, I'm sure it can, but it's not just the music at the end of the day. It's because you can sit at home with your records, but you got to find people with similar interests going out to shows. That's, that's a big one, you know, D doing things with people, involving music, joining bands. Now, just like my mom and dad influenced me, will be just like I influenced my own kids both of them, and if I'm lucky, they might even realize it sooner than I did. It takes a while. It did for me. And the cycle continues. Finally, I asked my son Riley if he ever hears my voice in his head. 
telling him to do things or not do things in his day-to-day -day life? Uh, not, not particularly, probably because I, I see you a lot, like once or two times a week. So I, I literally do hear your voice about three times a week, but it's usually you talking. Um, I, I, I feel like eventually I will have, I, I could see that happening. The world is full of fathers, but the measure of being a true man has nothing to do with money, achievements, skills, uh, degrees that you get. All children need their mother and they need their father. I had two loving parents when I grew up that stayed together until death parted them. And as my children know, divorce is a very difficult thing to deal with as a youngster and then to take it with you throughout the rest of your natural life. Everything you have, everything you've achieved, you are who you are because next to God and country, you've put your family and your children as the most important things in your life. For me, nothing gives me greater peace, joy, contentment, or satisfaction than trying to be the best daddy and dad that I can be. The Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Our show is put together by producer Paul Hart with the assistance by Robert Randall, Bruce Klein, and S.T. Dog. We were mixed by Chad Loebner, technical director Linus Shapiro. Musical assistance by the Walrus Filters, Riles Hartley, and the good people at Storyblocks Video and Audio. On this show, special thanks to Heidi Hart, Riley Hart, and Trace McClintock. Don't forget to visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.buzzsprout.com. Help us grow and continue by liking or subscribing on Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with more stories from Life's Learning Curve. How do they do that?